Yes, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to um, welcome Alan Robach. I've, I've known him for a long time, largely through his spectacular detailed radiative studies of the effects of aerosols on climate, including volcanic aerosols and debris from large explosions. And um, I just feel like his work is really important and careful and compelling. So I'm glad to have him as a, a somewhat distant colleague over there on the East Coast. And um, yeah, let's see what he has to say today. Okay, thanks for inviting me. For those of you who don't know me, I, I got my bachelor's degree in meteorology at Wisconsin in 1970. When I started the meteorology department was in Science Hall. And I remember moving to the brand new building when I was a junior that you think is really old now that you're in. And uh, I, I lived on uh, Mifflin Street for the last two years. First, I started out in Celery Hall, but then it, I was there for the first Mifflin Street block party. And uh, I got tear gas three out of the four years trying to stop the war in Vietnam. So it was interesting times. And uh, it's nice to be back there, at least virtually. I hope to get back for a football game. I get back for a football game every once in a while. Uh, so I went to my first Rutgers. I'm a professor at Rutgers now. And now Rutgers is in the Big Ten. Uh, and I went to my first Rutgers football game last fall when Wisconsin destroyed them. That was, and I rooted for Wisconsin, of course. So uh, let me let me share my screen. And I'm going to uh, talk about some work I've been doing. I work on, I've worked on volcanic eruptions and uh, their effects on climate. And now I'm working on what would happen if smoke from uh, nuclear war got into the atmosphere. And Please stop me if you want to ask questions while I'm going on or, 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 or ask questions at the end. Either way is fine. So I'll talk about global famine after nuclear war. And most of this work is funded by the Open Philanthropy Project, which is a, a group funded by a Facebook billionaire, because uh, it's been hard to get money from the federal government. So most of you meteorologists know who Sherry Rowland was. He, got the Nobel Prize in chemistry in, uh, for his work on ozone depletion, along with Mario Molina and Paul Crutzen. This is his obituary in EOS. And he said, what's the use of having developed a science well enough to make predictions if in the end, all we're willing to do is stand around and wait for them to come true? Is it enough for a scientist simply to publish a paper? Isn't it a responsibility of scientists if you believe that you have found something that can affect the environment? Isn't it your responsibility to actually do something about it enough so that action actually takes place? So these ideas are, are what stimulate me to work on this, what can be a very depressing topic. So I'll talk about nuclear winter theory and then analogs, uh, things that happen in the climate system that inform us about parts of the theory. So we don't really wanna test it in the real world policy implications, and then doing something about it. So recently I've joined the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, which is a group of scientists trying to lobby the government to make the world safer. At the Fall AGU meeting two years ago, here's a picture of some of us old guys who worked on this. Rich Turco, Brian Toon, Tom Ackerman, me, and Gira Stenchikov, uh, who was from Russia and then worked with, with us in the United States. Uh, I'm still working with Brian Toon uh, on this project. We've also entrained some younger people to work with us. Uh, Cheryl Harrison and Nikki Lewandowski are ocean modelers. Lily and Jonas are crop modelers. Julie Lundquist models, models firestorms and how much smoke would go into the atmosphere from fires. And Mike, Chuck, and Josh are global climate modelers. And I have a group at Rutgers including with Lily, uh, we have grad students and postdocs, and we're funded by NSF, Open Philanthropy, and Silver Lining, and we're looking at also the effects of climate intervention, geoengineering, which is another way aerosols could get into the atmosphere, and we're mostly working on crop impacts and how to improve the crop modeling, and we've made, made uh, published many papers, and you can go to my website and Download any of them if you want to learn more about it. Here's the story. Here's our beautiful planet. But after a nuclear war, it would look like this with 
smoke covering the northern hemisphere and then drifting into the southern hemisphere, blocking out the sun and making it cold and dark at the Earth's surface. If there was enough smoke, it, we would have a nuclear winter. That is, the temperatures would get below freezing even in the summertime and we couldn't grow any crops. It would be, uh, and there would also be more ultraviolet radiation because ozone would be destroyed in the stratosphere. Here's a history of the number of nuclear weapons that have been deployed on Earth up to 2020. It has the two countries with the most weapons, US and Russia on here. And you can see there was a nuclear arms race and then it ended. Could somebody tell me how many countries there are with nuclear weapons today? Please unmute and just speak up. Is it like 12-ish? 12-ish, uh, that's a good guess. Anybody else? Maybe nine. Nine, nine? okay. I was gonna guess like 15. 15? One. Okay. One, the, the answer is, is, is actually nine. There's the US and Russia, and then there's China, England, and France, and India and Pakistan, and North Korea and Israel. But the U.S. and Russia have more than ninety percent of them, so that's that they they're the ones that mainly produce that uh, have the weapons. Now uh, there was an arms race and it ended. Why? Well, in 1982, Crutzen and Burks published a paper saying, looking at impacts of of nuclear war on tropospheric air pollution, especially ozone, and there are photochemical reactions involved. And they said, by the way, there'd be a lot of smoke from the fires, and that would affect the ozone, but it also might cause climate to change. And people said, really? Whoa, nobody thought about that before. And so the next year, two groups, a, a Russian group and an American group did intensive climate modeling simulations of what the impacts would be. And they both found out that there would be nuclear winter. The uh, temperatures would get below freezing. And then the next year, I did a uh, simulation and, and a group at NCAR did, and we all got the same result. And then the arms race ended. Did we have anything to do with it? Well, it wasn't the end of the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union didn't end until another five years. And uh, by the way, the number is still not zero. So although the number has been going down over time, we still have a lot of nuclear weapons on the planet. Now, when we do research, we run models, we look at observations and data, analyze it. That's how scientists work, but how do historians answer the question of whether we had any impact. And it's pretty simple. They just ask the people that made the decisions. So Ronald Reagan was the US president and he and Mikhail Gorbachev decided to stop the arms race. And uh, he said a great many reputable scientists called us reputable are telling us that such a war could end up with no victory for anyone because we would wipe out the earth as we know it. You think back to natural calamities back in the last century in the 1800s, volcanoes. We saw the weather so changed, there was snow in July in many temperate countries. And they call it the year in which there was no summer. Now, if one volcano can do that, what are we talking about with the whole nuclear exchange, the nuclear winter that scientists have been talking about? And Gorbachev said, models made by Russian and American scientists showed that a nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter that would be extremely, extremely destructive to all life on earth. And not so that was a great stimulus to us. So in this case, it was scientists informing policy and they both listened to us because uh, they're getting the same message from both sides. That was a long time ago, before you all were born, 40 years ago. Why am I even talking about it now? I want to answer two questions. Although the Cold War and the arms race are over, could the remaining arsenal still produce nuclear winter? And what about the consequences of a much smaller number of nuclear weapons uh, in a regional nuclear conflict with some of these new countries? And the answers are, as I'll show you, Yes, and it would last for a decade, last for many years, much longer than we thought before. And uh, a war, say, between India and Pakistan would not produce nuclear winter, but the, the, the direct effects would be horrific, as you know, from blasts, radioactivity, and fires. And it would also have severe impacts on global agriculture. Now, during World War II, on March 10th, 1945, the US sent two airplanes over Tokyo and 
with napalm and plant and and at nighttime and did a flaming X on the city. And then more than 300 airplanes followed with incendiary bombs burning the city down and burying to death more human beings than any time before since in the history of mankind. And after that, every three days or so, they sent fleets of bombers to burn other cities in Japan to try and win the war. And the, uh, the size, and this is a, a map done by the US Army, the size of the equivalent New American city is here in uh, New York was the size of Tokyo. They couldn't bomb military targets during the daytime because their bomb sites weren't very good and they could get shot down. So they decided just to burn cities willy nilly and pretend that every citizen there, including the children, were, were enemies. And they killed 800,000 people. So this is a policy of the US Air Force during 1945. The last two cities that they burned were Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in those cases, they used one atomic bomb each rather than many, many bombs. So that was already the policy. On August 6th, the 15 kiloton bomb killed about 150,000 people, some directly and some over time from radiation. A kiloton is a thousand equivalent explosive power of a thousand tons of TNT. You may have heard of the mother of all bombs a couple of years ago dropped in, in the Middle East. Uh, that was a 10 ton bomb. This is 15,000 tons, a thousand times stronger. So these are horrific, huge bombs, but they're, they're very small by today's standards. And the current world arsenal is so large that if you dropped a Hiroshima sized bomb every two hours, every day, starting in August 6, 1945, up till today, you still couldn't use up our current arsenal in terms of explosive power. This is the airplane that did it, the Enola Gay. This is before it was put back together. This is in the, uh, in the warehouse at the Smithsonian Museum. And this is a mock-up of the uranium bomb, the little, little man who, that was dropped uh, and uh, little boy. And this is the back and the front of the plane. That's me back when I had hair and it was black. <laughs> the picture on the left is the mushroom cloud from the explosion. And the picture on the right, often misidentified as a mushroom cloud, is actually a pyrocumulonimbus cloud three hours after the attack, generated by the fires that uh, produced upward motion and condensation and a big thunderstorm, pumping the smoke up into the lower stratosphere. This is what would happen after uh, atomic bombing uh, and cities that would be bombed by nuclear weapons. Some of the survivors remember the fires. This is a drawing done by one of them, and this is a drawing done by another one of them. And this is what Hiroshima looked like afterwards. Only a few uh, stone buildings uh, uh, and, and some metal structures remain. Three days later, we dropped a bomb called Fat Man, which was a plutonium bomb, a, an implosion bomb. This is a picture from the museum there uh, of Fat Man and the bomb. And this is the mushroom cloud from Nagasaki. It was a 20 kiloton bomb. And this is what Nagasaki looked like afterwards. So unfortunately, that, that's not the only way to burn cities. Uh, in 1906, we have the analog of San Francisco. There was an earthquake there and it produced a fire that burned the city down. Jack London, the famous author, wrote, within an hour after the earthquake shock, the smoke of San Francisco's burning was a lurid tower visible 100 miles away. And for three days and nights, this lurid tower swayed in the sky, reddening the sun, darkening the day, filling the land with smoke. I watched the vast conflagration from out on the bay. It was dead calm, not a flicker of wind stirred, yet from every side wind was pouring in upon the doomed city. East, west, north, and south, strong winds were blowing upon the doomed city. The heated air rising made an enormous suck. Thus did the fire of itself build its own colossal chimney through the atmosphere. So this is a classic description of a pyrocumulonimbus uh, pumping smoke up into the atmosphere. This is what San Francisco looked like afterwards. So the University of Nagasaki has a has a, a center there for the, and they publish every year a count of the total global nuclear arsenals. 
This is the most recent one from June last year, 13,000 nuclear warheads on Earth. This is US, this is Russia, these are the other seven countries. Each red symbol is five land-based warheads. Each blue one is five land-based or uh, submarine-based warheads. Each green one is, is five aircraft-based uh, bombs. And the gray are ones that have been retired. So it's a little hard to see, so let me blow it up. Uh, the US and Russia each have 6,000 weapons. Uh, some of them, a couple thousand each, are not available right now uh, for use, so 4,000 weapons each side. The other countries have a couple hundred each. Why? So let me ask you another question. If you want to use your nuclear weapons as a deterrent, if you want to put uh, uh, nuclear weapons on the capital city of your enemy to deter them from attacking you, how many do you need? Just one. One, excellent. So maybe you need two, because maybe the first one won't work. So these countries have decided that a, a couple hundred or a, a hundred are more than enough they could build as many as they wanted. Why do the US and Russia have so many? I keep asking myself that question. What about all the other countries in the world that could build nuclear weapons and have chosen not to? What can we learn from them? All right, another question for the audience. This is a, a, a photograph taken from this, the uh, International Space Station and it's this orange line here is a boundary between two countries. Can somebody tell me what the, what the countries are on either side of this boundary? Is, is that North and South Korea or is that Germany? Uh, it's not North and South Korea because if it was North and South Korea, one side of the line would have no light. <laughs> True. So East and West Germany then? No, uh, there's, no board, there's no border there anymore. Uh, <laughs> this is India and Pakistan and Afghanistan in the distance. And each of these lights is a huge city, some of which you've never heard of, I'm sure. So Karachi, 24 million people, Hyderabad, Faisalabad, and India has big cities too, in the Indus River. And so 15 years ago at the AGU meeting, I ran into Brian Toon and Rich Turco in the hall and they said, somebody asked us, what would happen if India and Pakistan had a nuclear war? They both have nuclear weapons. And we did a calculation and we, first I told them not much, but then I said, well, you know, it might produce 5 million tons of smoke if they each bomb cities in the other country. This is when each country had about 100 weapons and the scenario we looked at was 50 weapons used on each side. Now, we used to think that was the place in the world that most likely a nuclear war might start. There are all kind, there are often wars fought and, and skirmishes in Kashmir, which they both claim, and people dying. And uh, in fact, a couple of years ago, a, an Indian aircraft was shot down over Pakistan. Fortunately, it did not lead to uh, a nuclear war. They returned the pilot. But you can imagine a skirmish escalating due to poor communication, misunderstanding, panic, or fear. You know what happened two weeks ago? Does anybody read the news two weeks ago? India, by mistake, launched a cruise missile at Pakistan. It flew up to 40,000 feet and ended up landing in a place where it did not destroy anything, did not hurt anybody, and it did not have a weapon on it. And India didn't even tell Pakistan about it. Pakistan announced it two days later. So it makes you, uh, India said it was a mistake. They were doing maintenance and it was launched by mistake. But it makes you, <laughs> it's another way a nuclear war can start. Imagine uh, if it had a nuclear weapon on it. So it just makes you wonder about how much control India has of their, of their weaponry. So this is a place where a nuclear war could start. Uh, lately, there've been skirmishes along the uh, China-India border too. And of course, we all know that Vladimir Putin is threatening to use his nuclear weapons. Uh, which makes it really scary. So we decided to calculate what would be happen. They said 5 million tons of smoke. So we had a, a climate model that was, we were using to look at the effects of volcanic eruptions on climate. So we just put smoke in there. 
And the direct effects would be horrific, but uh, we used the NASA GIST Model E general circulation model, which had fairly low resolution by today's standards, 15 years ago, but it had a stratosphere and mesosphere. And so it, it simulated the lofting of the smoke, the heating, the sun heating the smoke and lofting it up into the atmosphere. We put it in the upper troposphere, the 150 to 300 millibar layer. And so here's a movie we made. Uh, on the right is the horizontal distribution of the smoke. On the left is the vertical distribution, globally averaged. This black line is the troposphere. And so quickly it will be lofted into the stratosphere, not the lower stratosphere, but the upper stratosphere because it would be heated by the sun. And it'll have an e-folding lifetime of about seven years. It would stay up there for many years being blown around covering the whole earth. Then I plotted the temperature change globally average. It would be instant climate change. This is global warming that we know and love and working to study, but this would be the instant climate change you would get globally average. And this would be climate change unprecedented in recorded human history. Temperatures would get lower than the Little Ice Age for a number of years. Every climate model, of course, is imperfect. And so two other groups did the same experiment, one in Switzerland and one at NCAR, and they found the same results. Global climate change unprecedented from using less, much less than 1% of the global nuclear arsenal. But it's much worse than that. Uh, this is a Trident submarine and the weapons on, and it can have about a hundred uh, warheads and each warhead has a hundred or 500 kilotons, not 15. So each one is a thousand Hiroshima's, not a hundred Hiroshima's like we modeled before. The U.S. has 14, and that's less than half of our arsenal. So the U.S. has the explosive power of, say, 25,000 Hiroshima's. And so does Russia, so that's 50,000 Hiroshima's. When we did the simulations in the 1980s, we did it with, it, TAPS did it, the Turco, Tun, Ackerman, Pollock, and Sagan, Sagan did it with a one-dimensional radio convective model. Uh, Alexander Fenstenchikov used a very simple Minsarikawa model, two layers in the atmosphere, 12 by 15 degrees horizontal resolution. I use an energy balance model. Uh, the group at NCAR used a model that only ran for 20 days, didn't have a stratosphere. So we said, let's take our modern model and go back and redo nuclear winter. And, and people said, we don't believe it. Maybe nuclear winter isn't right. The models aren't good enough. So we just decided to go back and redo it. So we use the same GIS, uh, GCM. We put 50 or 150 teragrams of smoke or megatons of smoke, not five teragrams. What could produce that? That was a standard nuclear winter scenario 40 years ago. It's the entire current arsenal of targeted that way, but it's only 404,000 weapons from, it's the uh, strategic weaponry of the US and Russia according to the New START Treaty. And how could our reduced arsenal now produce the same amount of smoke? It's because there were so many weapons in the 1980s that the scenario we used was a third of the arsenals of US and Russia and then we put a weapon on every possible target. And there were so many weapons that there were nine weapons for every target. So much overkill, bouncing the rubble. So here's a movie of the optical depth. Of course, it's much, the smoke is much thicker. It would still last for many years. And we looked at the uh, next year, a year later, June, July, August. This is summer temperature change in degrees Celsius. and <clears throat> we looked at uh, a place in the Ukraine where there's a lot of agriculture. There's an article in the New York Times today about how the, it's going to be a, a, a global food shortage this year because of the war in Ukraine and Russia, because they aren't going to be able to plant their crops. There's a, they aren't going to export wheat from Russia or Ukraine or Belarus. And they also, a lot of fertilizer is made there. So uh, these are, those are the indirect effects, even without a nuclear war. But we looked at the direct effects. So this is a place in Ukraine. And this is a time series of the daily minimum temperature. And the black is the control run. So uh, in the summer, it got up to 20, 25 degrees Celsius, 70, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. In the winter, it got below freezing. But when you put smoke in in May, instantly the temperature plunges and gets below freezing and stays there for two years or more. So clearly that's a nuclear winter and you can't do any agriculture. 
Recently, we were working with WACM, the, the whole atmospheric community climate model, the state-of-the-art model at NCAR. We've redone these simulations and WACM has a feature called uh, Karma, a, a, a model that will allow the uh, smoke particles to grow and get larger and fall out a little bit faster. It also includes ozone response, a much more sophisticated model. But we got exactly the same result. The red is Wacom, the green is GIS uh, temperature anomaly. These are the precipitation anomalies. Because the smoke falls out a little bit faster, the, the temperature recovers re re a little faster with Wacom, but still you have five years of temperatures much colder globally average than there was during the Little Ice Age when there were mothic ice sheets covering North America. You have all these glacial features in Wisconsin, you can drumlins and things like that, you know about that. We also found winter warming. We found uh, nu uh, what we call a nuclear Nino and El Nino for seven years after it. Uh, so a lot of interesting dynamics, but I don't have time to talk about that now. But our papers will describe that for you. Now, we decided to revisit Pakistan and India because now they're having a little bit of an arms race. And so they may have 400 or 500 nuclear weapons total by 2025. And they've tested ones with larger yield than the Hiroshima bomb and the potential targets are a little bit bigger. And so we did a new scenario where India uses hundred weapons and Pakistan uses 150 and it would be 50 to hundred million people would die, it would be horrific. And there'd be more smoke, 16 to 36 teragrams of smoke. Published that a couple of years ago. Now, if you plot the global average temperature change from these different scenarios, the green line here is the US-Russia case, which I just showed you. The blue is the one I showed you before, which is the five teragram case. And these other ones are different scenarios, uh, different amounts of smoke, 16, 27, 37 teragrams. Now we call this India, Pakistan, but any nuclear war between any, any nuclear countries with which produced that much smoke would have the same climate response. Doesn't matter where the war is because the smoke would last for years and be blown around the world. So you can imagine a war between India and China or, or something started by Israel with Iran or, or, uh, uh, or uh, so NATO getting involved. Anyway, we, we want to inform the world, if you put this much smoke in the atmosphere, what would the climate, how would the climate change? And I, this is from the, the GIST model. Uh, I this is global warming observations, and this is the five teragram case, 50, 150. And just a reminder, global average temperature was about five degrees below current conditions when there were mothic ice sheets 20,000 years ago. But what we really care about is food. The most important impact of climate change is how much food is there. Already there's not food, there's food insecurity in some parts of the world because of distribution. We worry about global warming, how it'll affect food and water resources. But for this, we focus on food. How would nuclear war affect food? Well, it would get darker, it would get colder, there'd be less rainfall, the whole hydrological cycle would be weaker. There'll be other things like chemicals and the uh, air pollution. We can't, the seeds we have, we couldn't use for a different climate. There'd be lack of fuel for machinery, water supplies, pesticides, uh, distribution system, and, and enhanced ultraviolet. So far, we've been able to look at just these major things, temperature, sunlight, and rainfall. And we put these into a crop model to try and evaluate this. So we have a new paper that's in review at Nature Food. We got the reviews back, we've submitted a revision, we hope it will be published very soon. And you're some of the first people to see these results. We hope it will be published soon enough to influence global policy. So what did we do? We took the crop model from the NCAR uh, community or system model, community land model, CLM, which models the effects that, of the forcing I just told you on the major food crops, corn, rice, soybeans, wheat, and also on grasses, which are used to feed livestock. And another question is, if you can't grow food on land, can you go fishing? So we, looked, we, took, we took a state-of-the-art fisheries model and saw how it would affect fish. And for livestock, for cattle and sheep, uh, which are ruminants, they are about half fed by pasture and half by 
feed. And we got FAO data for what the diets are in every country in the world and how the animals, how much livestock they have, how they're fed. And we put this all in to analyze in each country what would be the effect on food. So for the crops, uh, this is how the total cal caloric content of crops would change for these different scenarios compared to today. Be a 90% reduction for the nuclear winter and up to 50% reduction for years for the India-Pakistan case. In the case of the oceans, there would be less of an impact because temperatures wouldn't fall as much over the ocean. Uh, but uh, as people overfished, the amount of fish would go down over time. If you combine these, because our global diet is only you know, a few percent fish, it looks very much like the crops. And on the grasses, the impacts would be a little bit larger than for crops. Now, this is something I learned doing this. Uh, how much food do people eat on the average? 2,855 kilocalories per capita per day. In our vernacular, we call this calories, not kilocalories. So 2,900 calories per day. Half of it comes from these uh, grains, wheat, rice, corn, soybeans, other crops. 31% from seeds and other fruit and vegetables, uh, potatoes, things like that. 18% from livestock. A very small part of that is fish. This also includes uh, dairy and eggs. And but if you look at how crops are used, the, the uh, only 43% is used for food, 24% is used to feed some animals and 8, 9% the ones that graze, some of it is lost. If you look at these wedges, the, the dark one is how much is food. So for corn, only 18% goes for food, Doritos, tacos, popcorn. Most of it's used to feed animals and some of it's used for biofuel and for other things. For rice, eight, more than 80% is used for food. For wheat, 70% for food. For soybean, only a small part for food. Uh, most of it's for animal feed. So one of the questions is if there's a nuclear war and there's less food, should we stop feeding animals and eat what we would feed them instead? So we looked at that scenario too. So we took these different scenarios. One is if we kept the livestock. So there'd be a reduction in cereals, reduction in other crops and reduction in, in fish. The marine fishery effort would not change. We would continue to feed uh, livestock and uh, all the feed would go for animal feed. And then we had a, a no livestock case where we, we would uh, consume all the livestock in year one and stop feeding them and eat what we could of their feed, the part that we can eat. And we would boost the marine fishery effort. So for a couple of years, there would be more fish. And then we did partial livestock. We kept partial them, some of them. And, and then we said, so we don't know when a war would be. So there's only about 60 days of food stored in the world. So let's assume that that's all eaten up. So let's look at year two after there's no more food stored. How much food could we grow? How many people could we support? And this is a map for year two. And we assume there would be no trade in food. Food would not be, people would hoard food just like they hoarded toilet paper. And so for different scenarios, the green on these maps are there'd be enough food for people. The yellow is that people would be losing weight, eventually starve, and red, they would starve very quickly. So for the five teragram case, in many places, it would be okay. But for the 37 teragram case, uh, the high latitude places, US, Canada, Russia, China, Europe wouldn't have any food. And we looked at uh, these scenarios for livestock or for the partial livestock. It didn't make much difference. And then the case is, let's assume that how many people would, would, would be still be alive? So in year two, let's assume that we already know how many people are gonna die. We don't give them any food at all. We just feed the people that will be alive. And this is the percent of the people that will be alive for the 37 teragram five and 150 teragram case. So if it's red, less than 25% of the people would be alive. And brown, less than 1%. And then uh, we calculate how many people would starve. And so 
uh, for the 37 teragram case, there'd be over 100 million people would starve in the US, Russia, and China, and other places, it wouldn't be as many because there's, there's fewer people. And we quantified this by looking at what fraction of the food we would serve to people that we could eat, uh, which are these different tick marks. The yellow is the livestock case. The pink is a partial livestock case. And we calculated for these different scenarios, how many people would be, uh, what percent of the people would survive and how many people would die. And so let me just show you this one table. Uh, for 37 teragrams, this is what we used 2010 data. That was the latest data we had on all the food. Uh, uh, there are almost 7 million billion people in the world. 2 billion people would die. For the nuclear winter, more than 5 billion people would die. And it wouldn't really matter what we do with livestock because the, what they eat uh, would, would go away too. There wouldn't be grass for them. So it wouldn't make much difference at all. And finally, uh, the smoke in the atmosphere and the stratosphere would heat the stratosphere. This is just for the five teragram case, 50 degrees warmer than normal for years. And this would destroy ozone and this would allow more ultraviolet radiation in. And more ultraviolet radiation would produce skin cancer. It would have effects on crops and it would have effects on fish. It would st stop the base of the oceanic food chain, the, uh, the plankton that are on the surface. And we recently published a paper last year on the five teragram case, how much UV would come and how much uh, different types of UV, how much skin cancer. And that, in that case, the smoke wouldn't be thick enough to block the excess UV and more would get to the surface. But uh, if there was a India, a US Russia case, there would be so much smoke that the excess UV would be absorbed only the UV that doesn't get absorbed, which causes cancer would go up and the other UV would go up after the smoke dissipated. Now, let me just talk, the, everything I've talked to you about so far is theory, but let me talk a little bit about analogs. You know, in the winter, it gets cold. So we have a gut feel for that. We know at night it gets cold. I showed you, unfortunately, we have examples of cities burning and about smoke and dust transport and surface temperature effects. There's Martian dust storms. There's the asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs. There's forest fires. There's Saharan dust being blown around and volcanic eruptions. Let me just give you two examples. Uh, there were huge forest fires in Canada in 2017 that pumped smoke in a pyrocumulonimbus like I showed you over Hiroshima up into the upper troposphere in the lower stratosphere. It was heated by the sun and lofted farther up into the stratosphere. And then we use the same climate models we use to simulate nuclear winter to simulate it, and we're successful at it. And we got a paper published in science about it. So by the, when this paper was published, uh, the smoke had been up there for more than eight months and it rose by 10 kilometers within two months. So let me just show you one figure. This is in the first 10 days. Some of these lines are observations from satellites of the smoke going up. And some of these lines are the model simulation going up. So rapid ascent in the first 10 days. Three years later, there were much bigger fires in Australia you may have heard about. And that pumped even three times as much smoke up into the lower stratosphere. And many studies have shown it lofted 20 kilometers and, and stayed up there for more than a year. This is the Tambora eruption that produced the year without a summer that Ronald Reagan was talking about. This is Harold or Sigurdsson up on the, the crater. And this is a graph of the June temperatures in New Haven, Connecticut from a book by Stommel and Stommel. There were huge uh, uh, temperature drops in New England and crops failed. There were, there were killing frosts in the summertime. There was a mass migration out to the Midwest into the Midwest where there was, they heard that there was good soil. Uh, Gillen Wood wrote a book about Tambora a couple years ago. He said for three years following Tambora's explosion, to be alive almost anywhere in the world meant to be hungry. And there was famine in Europe and in India and in China. This is just an example, but it only lasted a couple of years. It wouldn't last for, for f five years or more after a nuclear war. 
So the science conclusions, a nuclear war between nuclear states using less than 3% of the current nuclear arsenal will produce climate change unprecedented in human history. Such a so-called small nuclear war could produce global starvation with massive increases in UV. The current arsenal can still produce nuclear winter killing most of humanity. So how do you feel? I love Bob Dylan. I took this picture before they yelled at me, no pictures. And uh, it's a good question to ask scientists. Uh, and I'm sorry, you know, this is really depressing. It's probably not nice of me to present you with such a depressing story. So what do you do with this information? <clears throat> I don't know, Matt, it's gonna be on the exam. If not, uh, you can just forget about it. As Mark Twain said, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. It feels better not to focus on such depressing things. And people ask me, so why are you working on it? Well, I told you uh, the same philosophy of Sherry Rowland. I'm trying to do something to prevent it from ever happening. So I wanna to try to do something about this. This is the situation we're in right now. Now, there have been attempts, first of all, to ban nuclear weapon tests and Right now, there's a comprehensive test ban treaty. Now, in 1963 was the first partial test ban treaty, prohibited testing in the atmosphere. When did this happen? Right after the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis shocked the world that we might have a nuclear war. And so maybe this Ukraine-Russia thing, after it's over, which I hope is very soon, it will shock the world into uh, doing more about the current arsenals. Anyway, that's what happened. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty prohibits any tests. The U.S. hasn't signed it yet, but Russia hasn't tested a nuclear weapon since 1990. The U.S. hasn't tested since 1992. There have been a few underground tests by India, Pakistan, and North Korea, however. There have also been tests to ban nuclear weapons to, to re, re, reduce the arsenal. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty attempts to prevent other countries from having nuclear weapons, uh, but it uh, the countries that signed it, including the US, Russia, India, or, or China, uh, uh, England, and France, agreed to a treaty on general and complete disarmament, but they've kind of ignored that until now. The only treaty which is out in effect is the New START Treaty, which limits the number of weapons that US and Russia can have. Uh, it was signed by President Obama and President Medvedev in 2010, and it required the US and Russia to have a maximum of 1,550 weapons of strategic warheads. It's on missiles, on submarines, and on airplanes. But a bomber counts as one, so they figure they can't count the number of weapons. So maybe each side has about 2,000 strategic weapons. And it was extended just after Biden took office uh, for another five years. So it's in effect until 2026. But as I've shown you, 4,000 nuclear weapons is still enough to produce a nuclear winter. So it hasn't solved the problem. Now, this is a map of the world. <clears throat> All the countries in blue have no nuclear weapons. There are no nuclear weapons in the Southern Hemisphere. In the Western Hemisphere, only one country, the US. In Europe, there's two, England and France. In Asia, there's six. But these ones in yellow are in treaties with countries that have nuclear weapons, and, and uh, like NATO, and they hope that our nuclear weapons will protect them. Uh, the uh, countries in orange actually have nuclear weapons, have NATO nuclear weapons based there, Turkey, Italy, Belgium, uh, and Germany. But there are, country, there are places with no nuclear weapons. And so, for example, these are all the treaties that prohibited nuclear weapons. Antarctica, Latin America, outer space, seabed, South Pacific, Southeast Asia, Africa, Central Asia. And the last one is called the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It actually prohibits and bans nuclear weapons. Until that time, other weapons of mass destruction like uh, landmines, uh, chemical weapons, biological weapons had been prohibited. But uh, these, this, finally, this treaty was, was passed. How did that happen? Well, uh, I, I'll get back to that. But the countries that keep their weapons say, well, you know, we want them for deterrence. We're not going to use them. We're just, they're just for deterrence. 
Well, does deterrence work? It certainly doesn't work against non-nuclear nations. Uh, the Soviets took over Eastern Europe when the U.S. had nuclear weapons. Did our weapons deter them? No. Was, was, what about in the Algerian uh, Revolution? How about French nuclear weapons? The Yom Kippur War, Israel was attacked. The Falkland Islands, uh, the UK was attacked. Who won the wars in Afghanistan or Vietnam? Okay, well, yeah, yeah, you're right, but uh, they're for deterrence against other nuclear nations. It's true, there's not been a nuclear war yet between nuclear nations. Was it just luck, which I think, or was it, uh, was it deterrence, or was it a general decline in violence, increased number of democracies, international organizations like NATO, the UN, EU? And the other thing is, uh, if deterrence, if you're gonna keep them for deterrence, deterrence has to last forever, and there can be no mistakes. Now, Brian Tuner and I pointed out that this idea of mutual assured destruction, MAD, if you attack me, I'm gonna attack you, is really superseded by SAD, self-assured destruction. If one country attacks the other country and the other country does nothing back, everybody in that first country is gonna die because there's not gonna be any food. So if you say, I'm gonna use my weapons for deterrence, you're acting like a suicide bomber. It's completely irrational. Now, I've been, able to go to Cuba. I took this picture near the Cuban Met Office, and uh, there's a little museum, outdoor museum there, and this is a model of the, a Russian missile that was installed in Cuba uh, in the 1960s. Each one had a megaton warhead, 77 times more powerful than Hiroshima. There were 36 of them in Cuba, and when the U.S. found out about it, they put a blockade around Cuba and told them to remove them and uh, it was very, we came very close to nuclear war then. On uh, October 27, 1962, as referred to as Black Saturday, the most dangerous day, there were, it turns out there were cruise missiles pointed at the US that we didn't even know about, uh, uh, nuclear missiles. A U-2 spy plane entered the Soviet airspace. A U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba that day. And, a, and, a, and there was a Russian submarine off the coast of North America and US Navy ships were dropping depth charges on it. They weren't trying to uh, kill it. They were just trying to get it to come to the surface. And, but the people in that submarine didn't know and they had nuclear torpedoes that nobody knew about. And, the, and a couple of the officers wanted to launch a nuclear torpedo. But the third officer, Vasily Akhipov said no and they didn't launch it. So he's called the man who saved the world. And there have been many other cases of coming close where there were uh, satellites that looked at reflection from clouds rather than missiles, or people put a training tape in. And so we came very close a number of times. I had a very surreal experience of going to Cuba and uh, the invitation of Fidel Castro and to talk about my nuclear winter work. I met him twice and I sat across the table from him and for more than three hours, he told me his whole history and he talked about how the Russians every day a ship showed up with supplies for Cuba so when they wanted to put nuclear weapons in he couldn't say no to them uh, but Cuba was one of the first countries to sign the treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons because they're really anti-nukes now uh, so President Kennedy who and, and, and Nikita Khrushchev backed off and didn't start a nuclear war they weren't crazy uh, Kennedy said, told in secret to to Khrushchev, if you get rid of your missiles in Cuba, we'll remove ours from Turkey. And But Kennedy understood this 60 years ago. So every man and woman and child lives under the nuclear sort of Damocles, hanging by a, the slenderest of threads, capable of being cut any moment by accident or miscalculation or by madness. The weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. But it hasn't happened yet. And uh, so accident or miscalculation or madness, you think of mad people in charge of nuclear weapons. Kim, tr Trump, uh, Putin, maybe, I don't know, but it's, it's pretty scary. Martin Sherman wrote a book about this, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis just recently published, and he said, the real lesson is that nuclear armaments create the perils they're deployed to prevent, but are of little use in resolving them. So we're lucky that for the past 77 years, there's not been a second nuclear war. And I think we can take some immediate steps to 
uh, make it less likely. Take the U.S. land-based missiles off hair trigger alert. They're sitting out there in Wyoming and Colorado, the, the Dakotas. If if they detect an incoming missile, they've got to be launched or they lose them. What if the what if the uh, warning is a mistake? There's a sole presidential authority to launch nuclear weapons. Why? Why does it have to be launched quickly? Why can't a committee do it? Uh, that, that's a history from President Truman required that it's been like that way ever since. Why can't we change our policy to no first use of nuclear weapons? All options don't have to be on the table. So there were a number of meetings uh, on three meetings on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons leading up to this treaty. I, I attended two of them and gave talks. You know, 146 nations came and learned about this and demanded of the rest of the nuclear nations to get rid of their weapons. And that's why they got the treaties passed. So it was done in the General Assembly of the United Nations and passed in 2017. And that was the hard part, getting countries to ratify them. And the nine nuclear nations have so far been ignoring this treaty, ignoring the will of the rest of the world. The 50th country ratified it a year ago, or in October 2020, and a year ago it came into force. And so there's 59 countries that have ratified it now. And so the number keeps going up. And they're going to have a meeting in Vienna this summer to of the all the countries that have ratified it, try and uh, for, for more put more pressure on the world on the other nations of the world. So they've given Nobel Peace Prizes for people that have and organizations that have worked to eliminate nuclear weapons. And the last one went to ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, for its work to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons partially based on our work, and for their groundbreaking breaking efforts to achieve this treaty, which they pushed through the United Nations. This is their symbol. I, I love their symbol. This was drawn by the Nobel Committee. Beatrice Finn, who's the executive director, when she accepted the prize in Oslo, said the story of nuclear, nuclear weapons will have an ending, and it's up to us to determine what the ending will be. Will it be the end of nuclear weapons, or will, will it be the end of us? One of these things will happen. The only rational course of action is to cease living under the conditions where our mutual destruction is only one impulsive tantrum away. And she said this when you know Trump and Kim were arguing about whose button was bigger. The policy conclusions. Nuclear weapons can be used if they exist. A nuclear war could start tomorrow by accident, hackers, computer failure, bad sensors, or unstable leaders. Nuclear arsenals do not deter attacks from non-nuclear states, terrorists, or pandemics. The only way deterrence could work is if states believe other countries are willing to kill themselves by using their nuclear weapons, and if there's a guarantee there'll be no unintended use. The only way to prevent a global catastrophe is to get rid of nuclear weapons. So the Physicists Coalition has more than 500 members and they, they lobby members of Congress and the president about taking action. Anybody can join, they may, including me, I'm not a physicist, I'm a meteorologist. And we give talks at different universities about it and try and get people to join. It doesn't cost anything. Anybody can join. So if you're interested, go to physicistscoalition.org. And you know, once a month, you'll get an email about uh, sign this letter to congressman, or there's going to be a webinar to learn about nuclear policy. Uh, and the advocacy is uh, we advocated in 20, 20, 2021 to no resumption of nuclear testing and extending the New START Treaty, which worked and currently we're advocating a no first use policy and talking about other ones. There's even, they even made a QR code if you wanna scan that. Uh, and so Carl Sagan was part of the team that, that worked to uh, uh, the first paper on nuclear winter and people said to him, don't you want to keep our nuclear weapons for deterrence? And he said, for myself, I would far rather have a world in which the climatic catastrophe cannot happen independent of the vicissitudes of leaders, institution, and machines. This seems to me elementary planetary hygiene as well as elementary patriotism. You can see what a great climate communicator he was. And for me, elementary planetary hygiene demands we eliminate nuclear weapons faster than the current pace, much faster. So I hope we learn from this and keep our beautiful planet looking like this for many, many years to come. And if you want more information, you can go to my, my website or just <clears throat> type my name into Google, which is an unusual name. You can find my, web, my homepage and find this information. 
I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Alan. There's so much interesting detail in there. And I'm surprised how much work you've been doing lately, like in the last five or six years. I, I jotted down a few um, references I'll have to look up. Um, maybe it'll help me with teaching 171, add a few aspects of what you've told us today. Yeah, well, I, I, have a, I have a PowerPoint that, uh, with many hidden slides you can have, but talk about it. And, and uh, that web page has all of our papers. You can download them. It turns out, you know, we were trying to get, we were just started doing this on the side. We had grants to do other things, study volcanoes, other things, but none of the agencies that we normally get money from, NOAA, NASA, NSF, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, you know, they wouldn't give us any money. Uh, I don't usually get money from them, but we said, you know, you guys have the weapons. Don't you think you should find out what would happen if you use them? You're not allowed, according to the law of war, to kill civilians. Department of Energy, formerly Atomic Energy Commission, Homeland Security. And I got a call from an, uh, an officer of Open Philanthropy Project. She said, could you give me some advice on a geoengineering project we we're thinking about funding? And after I talked to her, I said, by the way, would you consider funding uh, nuclear winter work? What's that? So Brian Toon and I sent her an audacious proposal five pages we asked for 1.2 million dollars for the next uh three years and she looked at it and said you know send us a bigger propo uh, proposal we'll send it out for review and if you need more money to get it done in three years ask us for more money so we asked everybody in our team and we asked for three million dollars <laughs> 2.98 million dollars and after a couple of months i heard back from her she said okay here's three million dollars and then three years later, we asked, can we renew it? And they gave us another $3 million. So we've been well-funded. It's And and also, uh, because it's a philanthropy, the university only takes 10% of it. So we don't have to pay 55% like from an NSF grant. So we we have a, that's why we have a big team doing all these different parts of it. It's very unusual. <laughs> no, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> I wonder if maybe some of the people in 405 or other visitors have a, a, a question or two for Alan. Is that Tom Whitaker, who was a student with me? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and unmute yourself if you or raise your hand and ask a question if you have one. As for me, I had to suppress myself the whole time. I had a question every minute. It's terrible. <laughs> There's so much good stuff in there. Well, you know, I sort of rushed through that, so I'll send you the Nature Food Paper when it's published, but all the other stuff we've done, uh, nuclear Nino, we found winter warming after the, uh, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive, it's the same enhanced uh, atmosphere, uh, Arctic oscillation, uh, positive mode you get after big volcanic eruptions, and so we found uh, uh, relative warming of the, of, the, of the tropical Pacific that lasts for years, and uh, this winter, the, the, some of the dynamical responses we even got in the, they were, were matched by the GIS model and the WACA model, so. How about Australia looks pretty safe, but yeah, it's a big Australia, contrast with Indonesia. That must have to do with their economic scenarios. It, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, Australia, the main crop is wheat, which doesn't get as affected as much as other crops. Hmm. And it's not that, not that uh, and they're, def, they're basically a wheat exporter. and they're in the tropics, so the climate change isn't as large. And aren't there many people in Australia? You know, Indonesia is the fifth largest country in the world. So there's uh, uh, almost 200 million people there. There's only 10 million or so, 15 million in Australia. So that's part of the reason too. And the plentifulness of kangaroos? No, I don't know. <laughs> well, um, you, uh, you, I guess since you don't, they aren't, they aren't livestock, you could probably yeah. eat kangaroos, yeah, so. No, I think that doesn't work in Wisconsin. If we all hunted the deer, that might last a few weeks, you know, it's not yeah. that big a crop. Yeah. Hey, I'm gonna have to stop the recording and head to the AOS seminar to get all that. All right, thanks a lot, Pete. Hopefully Thank the Zoom meeting will stay up and running after I exit it. I think it will. <laughs>